Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Buckle up and I, I just gotta say this right at the top. After today's show, please watch this video if you have not. It is a special bonus video I uploaded this morning. It is unlike anything we've ever uploaded to this channel, which makes it all the more amazing that like 90, 95% of people that have watched it love it. It's something we're aiming to do every Monday morning for you. And that's in addition, of course, to all the Philip DeFranco shows and all the goodness that you're normally getting. I'll also make it a top link in the description down below for you to make it very easy. But that said, Buckle up, make sure you hit that like button because you're getting filled in more than ever, and let's just jump into it. The Kanye situation has gotten worse, which is somehow both surprising and expected. Right, so for the past couple of weeks, Kanye's been out there saying disgusting, horrible things, spreading dangerous conspiracy theories, regurgitating lies, going on, you know, really fun anti-Semitic tirades. And let me be clear about this. I think Kanye West is a fucking scumbag. And not just because he's out there spreading lies and anti-Semitic garbage, but the fact that he's like excited and pumped to do so and loves the fact that he cannot be held accountable. One of the most notable parts in the Kanye West podcast that ended up getting taken down was this moment. The thing about it, me and Adidas, it's like, I could literally say anti-Semitic shit and they can't drop me. I could say anti-Semitic things and Adidas can't drop me. Now what? Despite what he'll say elsewhere to try to get heat off of him, he knows what he's doing and he's excited to do it. When I say the situation's getting worse, I don't just mean like Kanye saying more horrible stuff. We're seeing stuff bleed into the real world. On Saturday, for example, an anti-Semitic hate group hung banners from the 405 freeway in Los Angeles, including one that said Kanye is right about the Jews. With him also seen doing the Nazi salute, and that was just one instance of anti-Semitism in LA over the weekend. With attorney and city council candidate Sam Yebri tweeting that an anti-Semitic flyer was delivered to homes in his neighborhood. With others also tweeting photos of flyers that were allegedly to distributed in the Brentwood area with those containing conspiracy theories and specifically referencing people who work for Disney in the Biden administration and in public health. So you have the Los Angeles and Beverly Hills Police Departments both telling the LA Times that they were investigating these flyers. And of course, there's been a huge response to all of this. Everyone's sounding off, including uh, Representative Adam Schiff. His district is in Los Angeles. And he said, horrified by the vile anti-Semitism on display in LA this weekend. Tragically, it shows the power some hold to amplify hateful language and how quickly they can persuade others to express their own bigotry. We must condemn hate wherever we see it immediately and forcefully. Also, mayoral candidate Karen Bass specifically calling out Kanye saying, we must all condemn the hate spewed by Kanye West, which is real consequences that we saw in Los Angeles this weekend. And even this morning, you had Kanye's ex-wife, Kim Kardashian, tweeting, hate speech is never okay or excusable. I stand together with the Jewish community and call on the terrible violence and hateful rhetoric towards them to come to an immediate end. This has also led to the previously mentioned Adidas or Adidas facing a ton of pressure to drop its partnership with Kanye. But if you don't know, he works with them for his Yeezy line and the company said the collaboration was under review following those White Lives Matter shirts. So you had people wondering, you know, is that actually real? Is it actually under review? Especially since they just released a new color of Yeezys on Sunday. And so in addition to everyday people putting pressure on Adidas, you had the ADL, for example, releasing a campaign titled Tell Adidas to Run Away from Anti-Semitism. Saying Adidas allowing Kanye to continue to spew hateful rhetoric without consequence sets a dangerous precedent of giving social influencers a pass for being anti-Semitic. Businesses must act to protect against the spread of hate. Please join ADL in contacting Adidas and demanding they condemn Kanye's anti Semitism and reevaluate their partnership, which is also why if you hopped on Twitter, you had boycott Adidas trending and this seeming to gain a lot of traction because people say, you know, this would actually hurt Kanye or at least hurt him where he cares. Because according to Forbes, Adidas pays West over $200 million annually and the outlet estimates that his $2 billion net worth would fall below $1 billion if they dropped him. And of course, they're not the only company. Uh, Kanye was actually recently dropped from Balenciaga. Just this morning, we learned that he was dropped by talent agency CAA. But yeah, right now it's a developing situation. We're going to have to wait to see what happens next for the, uh, the human and anti-Semitic wrecking ball. I don't know, what are your thoughts here? And then, this is not Belle Delphine, not to try to be her PR or anything, but this is not her. And I say that because it appears that there's been some confusion inside of a controversy. And oddly, this connects to the Amaranth story that we talked about last week, where she came out on a live stream saying she was in an abusive marriage that he was allegedly forcing her to work against her will. Most people responded with empathy, with sympathy, saying, hey, I, th this is horrible. This sounds so scary. I, I hope you can get out of that situation. But uh, at least one person saw this devastating news and was like, how can I get the attention and make this all about me? With that person not being Belle Delphine, but rather social media model Ellie Ray, who actually going into her Twitter bio even describes herself as a dollar store Belle Delphine. Though to her and anyone that confused the two, I have to ask, how long have you been partially blind? You use them bleach eye drops? I'm just confused. But 
Ellie Ray was in the news this weekend because she tweeted photos of her dressed as Amaranth along with the caption, if I stop streaming for the Sims, he teaches me a lesson. And in those photos, you can see her feet tied to a chair with that being an obvious reference to the abuse Amaranth faced and her being forced to stream. Her original tweet has since been deleted, but of course you have tons of people calling her out, including one saying this cosplay was one of the most distasteful things I've ever seen. Others saying things like, I hope you know that this type of so-called humor is the validation abusers cling to and encourages the twisted reasoning they use to justify harming others. And of course, abuse is not a joke. Assault is not a joke. Have some fucking common decency. But also, even though she took down the original post, I don't want you to think that she feels bad because it appears that she is loving this attention because just this morning she posted another photo where she's again dressed like Amaranth with rope covering her body and legs tied to a chair writing, I'm sorry, might delete later. So really, it appears that she's trying to rage bait for dollars rather than being kind of a decent human being. Or I guess not even that, just not actively being a bad one. But hey, uh, congrats to her. This is the most you'll ever matter. And then the stock market has been a major focus of the news recently and it can feel incredibly hard to navigate on your own, which is why this is a great time to thank the fantastic sponsor of today's show, public.com slash DeFranco. Public is the only investing platform that allows you to invest in stocks, ETFs, crypto, and now alternative assets. Right? Things like fine art and collectibles all in one place. Thousands of stocks and ETFs, over 30 cryptos, and 25 alts with more coming soon. And in addition to being an all-in-one platform, Public gives you all the information and metrics that matter for the assets that you care about. You can browse the latest news related to an asset, share ideas with other like-minded investors, or even listen to Public live shows that feature conversations with experts and experienced investors across different asset places. And Public always puts investors first, and they don't sell trades to market makers or take money for payment for order flow. And amazingly, for a limited time, when you sign up at public.com slash DeFranco, you'll get up to $10,000 when you transfer your account from another brokerage. Just see additional terms and conditions by following the link in the description. And then, plastic recycling has been an abject failure. And that's not my opinion. That's just what the numbers say. Right, so a new report by Greenpeace found that only 5% of plastic waste generated by Americans was actually recycled last year. According to the study, U.S. households generated 51 million tons of plastic waste in 2021, and only 2.4 million tons were actually recycled, which is also a massive drop from 2014 when plastic recycling peaked at 10%. But a key thing to take away from this story is that this isn't just like about Americans personally failing to recycle their plastics, but rather that there are a ton of widespread systematic issues at basically every step of the way. For example, Greenpeace found that not one one kind of plastic packaging in the United States actually meets the definition of recyclable that is used by the FTC or the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's new Plastic Economy Initiative. In fact, even plastics that have long been considered recyclable, like bottles and jugs, fall way short of the 30% recycling rate that the foundation uses to define recyclable. And that's in addition to all the other kinds of plastics that are also labeled as recyclable, even though they fail to meet the FTC's classification. With the report also going beyond that and outlining five different reasons why plastic recycling is what it calls a failed concept. First, First, plastic waste is generated in such massive quantities and is extremely difficult to collect. Second, even if all the plastics were collected, the different mixes of plastics can't be recycled together. And in addition to many people not knowing that, it would also be functionally impossible to sort the trillions of pieces of consumer plastic waste produced each year. Third, the process of recycling is actually very harmful for the environment, not only generating microplastics, but also exposing workers to toxic chemicals. Fourth, recycled plastic is made of and contaminated by toxic chemicals, so it can't be reused for food grade material again. And fifth, the recycling process is actually insanely and even in some places prohibitively expensive. And so as a result, the Greenpeace report explicitly states, the plastics, packaging, and recycling industries have waged a decades-long misinformation campaign to perpetuate the myth that plastic is recyclable. And while all of this is going on, the production of new non-recycled plastics is rapidly increasing. With Greenpeace USA senior plastics campaigner Lisa Ramsden saying in a statement, corporations like Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, Nestle, and Unilever have worked with industry front groups to promote plastic recycling as a solution to plastic waste for decades. But the data is clear. Practically speaking, most plastic is just not recyclable. And Zalisa has called on corporations to back a global plastics treaty, which United Nations members created earlier this year, as well as move toward refill and reuse strategies. With Lisa adding, this isn't actually a new concept. It's how the milkman used to be. It's how Coca-Cola used to get its beverages to people. They would drink their beverage, give the glass bottle back, and it would be sanitized and reused. And here's the thing. It's not like an impossible concept. A number of other countries have actually implemented these kinds of practices. But given the absolutely insane power that corporations have in the U.S., it's probably unlikely that we're going to see change here. Right, as long as there's that much money to be gained or lost, we're not the United States of America, we're the United States of lobbying. And then, voter intimidation is already happening in Arizona. Y'all, November 8th is still two weeks away, and it's already happening. Right, so just this week, in the Maricopa County Elections Department tweeted out pictures of two armed individuals dressed in tactical gear that were seemingly watching over a mail-in ballot drop box in Mesa, Arizona on Friday, with the department going on to know that the people left after the sheriff's office arrived and adding, uninformed vigilantes outside Maricopa County's drop boxes are not increasing election integrity. 
Instead, they are leading to voter intimidation complaints. Although monitoring and transparency in our elections is critical, voter intimidation is unlawful. And obviously, all of this is fucking scary, especially when you consider all the threats of violence we saw in Maricopa County back in 2020 after it became a center point of Trump's efforts to overturn the election results in Arizona. But also a key thing here, in no way is that the only instance of voter intimidation Arizona has seen since early voting began in the state on October 12th, with a local outlet, ABC 15, reporting multiple other complaints have been filed with the Secretary of State's office recently. This including one where an Arizona voter wrote, there's a group of people hanging out near the ballot drop box, filming and photographing my wife and I as we approach the drop box and accusing us of being a mule. They took photographs of our license plate and of us and then followed us out the parking lot in one of their cars continuing to film. And another complaint from around that same time, a voter reported that camo clad people were taking pictures of them and their license plate as they dropped ballots in a box outside the Maricopa County Elections Headquarters. With a voter adding that when they approached the individuals and asked what group they were with, quote, they asked why I wanted to know. Well, it's because it's a personal attack. They basically said they're taking pictures looking for some fantasy BS on the voting citizen. And these are just some of the other similar complaints that are happening right now. But also beyond that, people watching these ballot boxes is something that reporters at ABC 15 have even witnessed and recorded themselves. With the outlet saying last Wednesday, they encountered a group outside of the Maricopa County election headquarters and adding that a man who wouldn't give his full name said he was watching the boxes as part of Clean Elections USA. And that does seem to track because according to the website for Clean Elections USA, it is an organization trying to recruit people to watch ballot boxes for fraud. But also a very key thing here, the website uses the same language about mules who it claims were paid to go from drop box to drop box, often driving from one county to the next to stuff what we can only assume were fraudulent mail-in ballots. With that obviously connected to the bullshit conspiracy theory, but it's one that has gained a lot of traction. Right, not only has this totally debunked claim been boosted by Trump, but as Vice reports, countless grassroots groups across the country have cropped up with the aim of monitoring these drop box locations and filming the people using them. With Vice saying that Clean Elections USA seems to be one of the most prominent, and the tactics this group claims to be using are incredibly alarming. With its founder, Melody Jennings, going on Steve Bannon's podcast last week and saying, we are posting pictures up of these mules, people are getting the word, they are showing up, or people are showing up and gathering around boxes and shutting this stuff down. But they're going on to claim that the group was geo-tracking voters and got cameras on the backsides of them. But understand, this is just a smoke screen for voter intimidation. They're counting on this to fuck up voter participation for those who aren't on the right. And so as far as what happens next, I mean, you have the Arizona Secretary of State's office referring all of the complaints of voter intimidation to the Department of Justice. But in the meantime, the situation is what it is right now. So I think one of the best bets you can do is come up with a voting plan right now. That way you're not waiting until last minute and then you're like, oh, I don't want to have to deal with the fucking weirdos that are going to be taking pictures of me. And you get the damn thing done and you don't give these fucking anti-democratic assholes any satisfaction. And then the UK has now chosen its third prime minister in just seven weeks. Or rather, the, the conservatives have now picked someone that they hope will not humiliate them like the last two did. I remember on Thursday, Liz Truss resigned after her tax cuts package crashed and burned, taking the British economy with it. With that then clearing the way for a new leadership contest, which looked like it might resurrect Boris Johnson from his self-imposed political exile in the Caribbean. And that getting cut short on Saturday when he suddenly flew back to London for an apparent re-election bid. And reportedly he got booed by his passengers along the way. But he got there and he joined other party members in a mad dash to garner enough nominations for a leadership spot. Saying on Sunday he had actually secured more than 100 backers within the party, putting him above the threshold. But he did ultimately conclude that he lacked the popular support to govern effectively. So just before the weekend came to a close, Johnson dropped out, leaving the UK with only one choice for prime minister. Rishi Sunak. He was a former finance minister under Boris Johnson and an MP since 2015, and his election is historic in a few ways. He's actually the first non-white leader, the first Hindu leader, and the youngest leader in two centuries at just 42 years old. But also, as others have pointed out, he's also one of the richest lawmakers in parliament, having worked for Goldman Sachs and two hedge funds, and being married to a daughter of an Indian billionaire, with the couple's fortune estimated to be worth around 730 million pounds. And as far as his economic policies, they're what you'd expect. He supports Brexit, deregulation, and lower taxes in certain contexts. Though, on that last part, he notably broke from Liz Truss's plan to cut taxes over the summer, saying that he would only do so once inflation came under control. Whether you love him or you hate him, he's really the conservatives' final shot to clean up the political economic mess left behind by the last two leaders. And as far as how he's going to stabilize the country, that's unclear right now, though uh, the one thing we do know is he will almost certainly stay away from the disastrous experiment in libertarian economics that sank trust. Right? Because since his last leadership bid in July, the economy has only gotten worse, with S&P Global actually saying this month the UK is effectively in a recession. There, pointing to data showing that economic activity hit a 21-month low. So next, also facing a cost of living crisis, still unresolved Brexit negotiations and internal party pressure over immigration. That's in addition to the external pressure from the Labour Party, which is expected to call for an immediate general election to ratify 
by his popular mandate, with the conservatives understandably terrified of that prospect because opinion polls put them far behind the opposition, so they would likely get swept out of power. Though, lucky for them, they aren't required to hold another election until the end of 2024. So as far as what happens next, Sunak should officially take power sometime today or Tuesday. Bojo, I imagine going back to the Caribbean, and I will keep my eyes on this story for you, and uh, all you gotta do is let me know your thoughts in those comments down below. But ultimately, that is where that story and today's show ends. Thanks for watching, subscribing, being a part of these daily dives in the news. If you haven't watched the morning show today, click that. You will not regret it. Or you can click it in the links down below. But as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.